welcome back, everyone, to actually, I'm going to start over because okay. your hand went up. Sorry. Welcome back, everyone, to Diary of an Empath. So today I have a very, very special guest. She is coming back for the second time. It is Dr. Z. Dr. Jamie Zuckerman is a psychologist and is an expert in narcissist relationships. She also runs an amazing podcast called It's Me, Dr. Z, and is an author of the book Find Your Calm. And I think you have another book that you that you recently authored as well. So she's got some books that are out that are amazing as well. Dr. Zuckerman's special specializes in the treatment of adults presenting with anxiety, depression, relationship difficulties, adjustment to chronic medical conditions, as well as everyday life stressors. And I had to have her back on because I love talking about narcissists. And we dove into that with one of our previous episodes. But today I want to get a little deeper with it. So Dr. Z, welcome back. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited for this. I am. I love having you on and I've loved, I've been, you know, I've been following you for a while. We've been following each other. I'm always your biggest cheerleader. And I think you're one of my favorite um, medical, you're one of my favorite professionals that talks about narcissists because there's a lot of people that are online and narcissist is a hot topic. Mm -hmm. But what I love about how you discuss things is like you, it's, it's not only just like, this is what the diagnosis is, but you give real life examples and and I just love how you present things and how it's so relatable for you. So for those that didn't listen to the previous episodes, maybe they're just tuning in. Tell me a little bit about yourself, your background, and how did you end up into this niche talking about narcissists? Mm -hmm. So yeah, so thank you for having me. Um, For those of you who don't know me, my name is Dr. Jamie Zuckerman. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist. And I I specialize in, as you said, I work with adults, uh, anxiety and depression, but I specialize in narcissistic abuse in relationships. So I work with uh, men and women who are either currently in, trying to exit, or on the other side of narcissistic abusive relationships. And that could be intimate relationships, it could be with a... um, a parent, it could be a sibling, and just give them the strategies to not only identify what they're in, but to give them kind of a language and give them skills and strategies on how to become objective to it and how to just navigate it. I love that. And, you know, for some people, the narcissist, it's something new for them. You know, they may have encountered a relationship in the past. They may have countered, encountered a parent in the past, but they never really understood what that name meant. So let's just keep it simple. What is a narcissist? What is narcissistic personality disorder? How do you define that? What does that look like? So narcissistic personality disorder is a pervasive style. It's a pervasive pattern. So it's in all domains of the person's life. It's not just somebody being an asshole in one relationship. It is somebody who relates to the world and themselves in a very specific way. And what that'll look like with narcissistic personality disorder will be somebody who presents as entitled. They are entitled to get ahead, because you know, take charge, be in control with very little to none, to no, empathy whatsoever for the people that they have to hurt in order to get what they want. Um, oftentimes they present with grandiose ideas. At the same time, people with narcissistic personality disorder can also present as, quote, victims. Everything happens to them. They're the one who... Um, you know, is it being abused? They're the one who needs, you know, the, the, the catering, the coddling, all of that. So it's not just somebody who presents as larger than life and is very self-absorbed. It's, it's a lot more than that. And it's a lot more complex than just that. Um, somebody with narcissistic personality disorder will be extremely manipulative. They'll use tactics like gaslighting and love bombing. Um, they will use your vulnerabilities against you. They do not take accountability for their actions. They will turn it around so that you feel, the other person feels that they are at fault, that it is their fault, that it's somehow they could have behaved differently than this wouldn't have happened. Um, I think that's very important to, 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 to kind of keep in mind. Um, and they're very, uh, they're very difficult to be in relationships with. They, they are not able to form or maintain healthy, stable relationships. They tend to be very verbally abusive, emotionally abusive, financially abusive, sometimes sexually abusive. Uh, and like I said, because they don't take accountability for their actions, because they feel they're entitled, 
They also don't think that it's their fault. And Mm -hmm. so they rarely will present for treatment. If they do, it's for something unrelated, Um, you know, and and they really uh, won't identify that they are part of this problem that's in this dynamic, which makes treatment for them extremely difficult. 100% agree with that. And I think what's interesting is that there are different dynamics to the narcissist. And sometimes you have someone who can be very overt. It's obvious. Like I dated a guy who I met in the gym. He just marked all the boxes. I'm like, oh my God, this guy's a complete narcissist. The withholding, the gaslighting, Mm -hmm. the love bombing was very easy to get rid of him. But I've met other people who are very covert. I also noticed that there are sometimes differences with how it shows up when it's non-romantic versus so like when it's a parent. So I would love to talk about that because I think when we think about the narcissist and when we hear it trickling online a lot, we think about romantic relationships. Everybody talks about, oh, the guy that I dated was a narcissist, but we rarely talk about parents. Mm -hmm. And I would love to get your intake on how that can show up differently when it's a parent who's a narcissist versus when it's a romantic relationship. Yes. So we don't get to choose our parents and that makes the dynamic automatically different, right? Because our partners, we choose them and we can let them go. With your parents, um, there's, you know, this, this, I don't even want to say societal, there's this just innate, um, you know, you, you take care of your children, right? And, and, and it, it, what a narcissistic parent does is it really goes against the grain. It really goes against maternal and paternal instincts, which makes this, um, very unsettling to talk about. And I think that's why people resonate so much with this because it's so, um, it, somebody else in, in the field described it as otherworldly. And I love that. And I use that. I can't take credit for it because when you hear the stories of children of narcissistic parents, it's so dysfunctional that it almost seems unbelievable, unfathomable mm-hmm. because it just is it, you know, and so narcissistic parents are different it, those dynamics are different. Like I said, we don't get to choose our parents, right? We also, you know, as children, we look at our parents to define our world for us, right? And so narcissistic parents are very good at crafting a narrative for a child very early on and using that narrative to define the child and the child internalizes those messages. And that's kind of what's used to control the child throughout their life. Um, it's very dysfunctional. It's very difficult to break free from because many adult children that I work with, they don't know their parent is a narcissist oftentimes until we start working on things. And, you know, I see that that very distinct pattern, that very distinct playbook. And it's only then that they start to be able to put a name to this and realize they're not crazy. And they'll hear stories from other survivors. They'll hear stories from other adult children of narcissists. And it's just this this kind of overwhelming relief. At the same time, it's also very scary because life as they know it and the way they view their parents as they know it is forever changed. Just like in intimate relationships. We always, you and I always say this, once you see it, you can't unsee the narcissistic playbook. Yep. Once you see it with your parents, there's no, there's no going back. And the difference is it's not, and when I say just, I don't mean to minimize it. It's not just a toxic mother, daughter, mother, son, father, daughter relationship. It's different. It is inherently different. And, um, it's very difficult and complicated to take yourself out of. That's so true. I posted something on TikTok about a situation I you know, went through our memory that I have with my mom just being in the car and her thing was always slapping and how now as an adult, my nervous system reacts when she comes around and it just kind of shuts down. I just go numb. Like I can't look at her. I don't, I don't react with any type of emotion. I just stay very flat, like a very flat affect because I didn't know this for so many years, but I realize now that that that's my nervous system preparing for her to come. And I have these memories and this is going to be, it totally is survival. And and as a child that worked for you, you needed to do that as an adult, you know, with this dysregulated nervous system, um, it, you know, it it doesn't work and it's very difficult to, to become objective to that. And, And it's great that you're able to realize that in the moment that you are shutting down. 
I remember, and this is going to be triggering for some, but I just remember even being about seven, eight years old and saying something, it almost was like that autonomy started coming out, that side of like, I'm becoming my own person. I'm becoming, you can't tell me what to do. And I remember her dragging me like caveman style, like by my hair, Mm -hmm. just little things that she would do like that. And the things that she would say, you're just like your dad, or even your friends think this about you. And I still remember those things till this day. I would love to hear your thoughts on this Mm -hmm. because that really affected me. And I still remember this, but I feel like once that autonomy started happening, that's when I started noticing these rages. And I almost feel like she was like a loving mother up until that point. So yeah, I think you you bring up in such a crucial point when you're dealing with narcissistic parents, particularly narcissistic mothers. Narcissistic mothers do not do well when their child starts to develop autonomy. And narcissistic mothers view their children, particularly daughters, as extensions of themselves. Therefore, your opinions, your values, your behaviors, your attitude, everything, your interests, your hobbies, the way you dress, down to your taste in music, the food you like, your weight, all of that is an extension of them. So it needs to be in line with their their world, how they function. Any deviation from that, any sense of autonomy down to just you having a normal human disagreement at seven years old is viewed by a narcissistic mother as abandonment, as rejection. Um, they'll mask it as disrespect. You're being rude. Mm. You're being obnoxious. Yes. You, you know, I'm your mother. You don't talk to me like that. And really what they're saying is you are not allowed to be your own person. You are mine. I control you. You are an extension of, of myself. You're an accessory. I brought you into this world. I sacrificed everything. I support this, this is this talk. This is what pisses me off when I hear my, my clients say this about the rants as a parent myself. It's like, Oh, it like makes my skin crawl. But you know, as a parent, listen, I, I mean, I have my moments where I'm like, I, I'm ready to like lose my mind, right. And go on vacation for a year and not come back. And at the same time, unconditionally love my children, obviously, Mm -hmm. unconditionally want them to be their own humans. Our jobs as parents, and I'm making a blanket statement, but our jobs as parents is to raise our children to be decent human beings, kind human beings, functional, contributing members to society. We raise our children to be able to be independent enough to leave us. You know, and, and I say that as a parent, it makes my stomach turn because I'm like, oh my God, I want to raise my children to be able to leave me. But here's the thing. Leaving you doesn't mean not loving you. Raising our children right. to be able to leave us means they become autonomous and we want that for them, right? And we're there for them if they need us, but we want that for them. A narcissistic mother does not want that for their child. They view spreading your wings and flying away as abandonment. I raised you. I supported you. And this is what I was going to say. This is what bothers me. They did, you, if you're going to have a child, right? And I'm not saying we don't have our issues with parenting and God knows we all do. Our job as parents, as mothers, as caregivers, whatever, is to be supportive of our children, to be there for them. So, you know, so when a, when a narcissistic parent says, I supported you all through your schooling. I supported you when you were crying from a breakup. Well, yes, because that's your job. And so what they'll do is they'll take these basic human needs and basic maternal duties and make the child feel responsible, make the child feel that they are lucky to have that or that they sacrifice that for you. And so the child grows up thinking that that type of behavior is conditional. And it's not. It's transactional. Correct. It's very transactional. Correct. And um, yeah, that sounds much better. Yes. A hundred percent transactional. Um, and narcissistic parents, you, you will see this happen when a child starts exactly like you said, when a child starts to develop their own opinions. And I will say this, Children of narcissistic parents 
One of the things that, and I don't want to minimize this, but one of the things that oftentimes comes out of that that is healthy and good, I haven't met one child of a narcissist who I've been working with, who hasn't been one of the most resilient human beings I have Mm -hmm. ever met. So a child of a narcissist, it's interesting because they tend to develop a sense of resiliency because they have to or else they won't survive. Um, And it just depends on what they do with that as an adult. But I mean, I got to tell you, it's, you don't have a choice. You're constantly in fight or flight mode. You're constantly waiting for the other shoe to drop. The love is so condition-based, but the problem is it's not consistent. So one day you could come home with, I got a hundred on my, or 99 on my exam. Oh, that's great. You're so smart. Look how smart my child is. And, and then you come home with a 99 the next time. Well, why didn't you get a hundred? You're stupid. You're this. And so they change the rules of the conditional love, but they don't bother to tell you they're changing the rules. They're just changing the rules to keep you on your toes, to keep you in that dynamic. Um, but autonomy, that is that is the narcissistic mother's worst nightmare. When the child gets married, when the child has their own child, it's very, very tricky. It's so interesting that you say that because everything is exactly what you're describing is, is my mom. And I know she's not a bad person. I know this stems from her trauma. And that's where I have a difficult time because I have that compassion. And I ended up growing up very empathic because of that, because I was constantly scanning the environment and the room for safety. Mm -hmm. And I ended up doing that into adult relationships. And I even remember my mom, and even now to this day, it's extremely draining. And I she will still to this day minimize my trauma. I remember being 15. And again, this is going to be triggering for some. A lot of my past is very triggering. But I can now openly talk about this. I had a sexual assault. And I remember my mom saying to me, you're not crying because you've slept, you've fucked so many men. And who says that to a child? And I, it's, it's like, yeah. you know, it's like those types of behaviors that my mom would minimize that trauma. Mm-hmm. But when it came to her trauma and little things like, well, look at how much you put me through when you were a teenager. And it's like, well, I'm 37 now. So, you know, I'm not sure what you want me to do as a child. I was reacting to sure. my own trauma. But it's like that victimness yeah. of, you know, I'm the victim. You're not. It's everyone else's fault around me. And so now as an adult, I have a really difficult time navigating that relationship. What is your advice to those that are listening that are like, oh my God, that's my mom who still haven't really cut those ties, have to maintain a relationship or don't want to cut those ties all the way. How does someone navigate having a relationship with your mother who's a narcissist and and continue to have some type of mother-daughter dynamic? Yeah. Oh, it's so, it's so... You know, no matter how long I've been doing this work for, the mother-child dynamic, I think, with the narcissistic mother is the one that still to this day, it just is just, it's so upsetting. So I think the first thing I would tell people is you're not alone, number one. Number two, you're not crazy. And number three, it is not your fault. Unfortunately, it has absolutely nothing to do with you. And... Part of the work that I do with people is mourning, you know, part part of the issue becomes when the child is still aiming for or the child is still hoping for a healthy relationship with the narcissistic parent. And a lot of the work that I do is mourning the loss of a relationship that you will never have with your parent. Mourning the loss of the um, closeness, the unconditional love, the trust that you want. You want to be able to call your mom and say, oh my God, you're not going to believe this. Don't say anything, you know, or hoping to get the support that you want when you're in a situation that's traumatizing. It's mourning the loss of that particular relationship and mourning the loss of a childhood that you were dealt that you shouldn't have been. And it's, 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 it's really difficult to give that up. And a lot of times I see my clients 
will say, you know, especially even about the holidays, right? They'll, they'll say, can you believe that my mom did this, this, and this? And my response is, well, yes, I can. Because that's what I would expect her to do. That is what I would expect your mom to do based on prior holidays and prior situations. And it's, my question would be, why are you so shocked, right? And so it's, it's, there's this idea of hope. I hope this time it's going to be different. And it's, it's really working on that hope because until you get past that, through that, alongside of it, whatever you want to say, you really can't set the boundaries that you need to because you're still falling back on, well, maybe it'll be different. And with that comes loosening your boundaries a little bit, which you can't do. So my, my advice would be to mourn the loss of that and set significant boundaries. And, and it's going to depend on the dynamic. It's going to depend on any given situation because sometimes you can only do five minutes. Sometimes you can do an hour with the person. Sometimes you, can't, you need a break of three weeks. And it's getting the person to understand that the boundaries are within their control. How the other person responds, mm-hmm. how the mom responds, we, we can't control that. But what we can do is set boundaries so you walk away from the situation feeling in control, in charge of your emotions, and feeling at peace. All people want in these narcissistic relationships is peace. But they look for the peace by trying to get something different from the narcissist, which will never happen. You need to get that sense of peace for yourself so that you feel kind of confident in your interactions with them. It will never be what you want it to be, ever ever. What it can be is less triggering, less anxiety provoking, um, and less detrimental, but that's going to be based on the boundaries that you set. So true. I think when I got to a point of acceptance with with my situation with my mom, I kind of had to just set those boundaries of like, okay, listen, like you're in my house. Like I have my own life. I am a literally a grown woman. I have a mortgage. I have a daughter. You are coming into my house. Like that's not mm-hmm. going to fly anymore. And especially when I got big enough where she, she couldn't yes. be physically demanding on me. So I was now able to set these boundaries. So then her reaction started to be, well, I'm going to go ghost for nine months. She's and then you. all of a sudden, re- yes, punishing me. But then I stopped right. reacting. That's right. And but then when she saw it wasn't working, okay, this isn't going to work. Then she'll kind of like come back around. I want to see. I want to see mm-hmm. Amina, my daughter, and you know she'll kind of make that yes. that loop around and act like nothing yes. ever happened. I kind of just had to to say to myself, she's not going to change. These are her patterns. So as long as she adheres to the boundaries, which means no criticizing, no yelling, no talking down to me or my daughter, no triangulation mm-hmm. and talking to my daughter about me because that's yeah. what she does, then you could be in my life. And I would love to talk about well, triangulation. And how does that show up with parents? To to kind of backtrack for a second, I think when you say like no triangulation, no manipulation, no criticism, it's more of when you do that stuff, I'm not going to tolerate it because you can't stop her from doing what she's always done. So it's, I think it's helpful to phrase the boundaries for people that are listening as I, my boundary is I'm not going to tolerate your criticism. Because then when they criticize, you you don't feel like you failed at your boundary. You know what I mean? Right. It's like if she criticizes me, she leaves my house or she doesn't come over. Rather than I'm not letting you criticize me, it's more I'm not going to accept your criticism. It puts the control more on you. So, so it's more like a you're, you're putting a boundary rather than yes, a rule exactly. is what I'm hearing. Exactly. Exactly. Because okay. what I don't – you know, people come in and I'm sure you hear this too. Like I set the boundary you set and it didn't work. And I'm like, okay, well let, let's look at this for a second. Did it not work? Or are you looking at setting the boundary as trying to get her to not do something she always does? Cause it ha- it's more about your response. Now in non-narcissistic relationships, in toxic relationships, abuse, remember not all abusive relationships are narcissistic in abusive relationships and toxic relationships. If you set that boundary, The hope is that slowly over time, you start to manipulate, and not in an unhealthy way, but manipulate their behavior, shape their behavior so that they learn if they want to speak to you, they have to respond to you in a certain way. With a narcissist, it's never going to be like that. And if it is, it's not genuine. They're going to shift their behavior to try to break 
through again, not respect your boundary, but try to break through. Like as you said, your mom will come back and she'll say, you know, oh, I want to see your daughter or, and act as if nothing happens. And meanwhile, you're sitting here playing catch up from the argument that you had two weeks ago. You're still angry. And then, mm-hmm. you know, why are you so angry? That was so long ago. Why are you in such a bad mood? Because they can just switch it off. Whereas you're still, because you're rationally minded, you're still, you're still dealing with what was said to you two days ago. Right. Um, so as far as triangulation goes in terms of a, a mom or, you know, a, a daughter who's a narcissist or a son to a mother narcissist, triangulation occurs when it's kind of like they, they pit two people against each other in a way, or narcissistic mothers love to be the owner of information. They love to be the owner of secrets. And what they'll do is they will they will specifically choose what information to tell one sibling, what information to tell another sibling. They won't tell them the same and everything gets confusing, but yet they're the one that owns all the information and and information is, it's, it's a commodity Mm -hmm. for them. They use it to manipulate the siblings, right? Or they will purposely pick a favorite child not because that child is their favorite, but because it gets them the most supply. They get what they need from them. So they give people roles in the family based on how much they can get from them at any given time. So the triangulation occurs when, let's say, for example, um, you know, there's the golden child, right, or the favorite child, and there's the scapegoat child. They will make that known, and they will treat each one in a certain way that then one, let's say, sides with the narcissistic parent because they're getting the favorable treatment and then it's the two of them against the other sibling. And it's it's very methodical. It's very purposeful. Yes, they know what they're doing. Um, and it's really a way for them to control dynamics. The triangulation that they do, it makes each person in the dynamic need them in a certain way, but then not need each other. And it's so it's it's it gives them control. Mm. Um And in order for triangulation to not happen, one person in that dynamic has to set a boundary, has to. And this is why children growing up with narcissistic parents, even if they're in the same house, have vastly different experiences. Interesting. So we have the holidays coming up. So for those that are like, I know I'm going to have to see my narcissist family member, what are some things that somebody can do step by step to prepare, set boundaries, or to navigate Christmas Day or whatever this holiday is when they're dealing with the narcissist. Yeah. So I always tell people, because I think we forget, you don't have to go. That's number one, right? We forget that's even an option sometimes. It was like, oh, I could never do that. Yes, you can. So there's, there's, you don't have to go. There's always, you can always leave. So I always like to put them first because I think we, we forget that we have that option. Um, you set boundaries. However, it's more than boundaries in these situations. It's expectations. You need to go into the situations knowing that it's going to be difficult. You need to go in knowing that they will do what they always do. It will be up to you to limit your emotional response to them. So, you know, people think that ignoring the narcissist or um, trying to argue with them or just get them to see their way, get them to see their viewpoint will work. It won't. The best thing you can do with a narcissist is starve them of what we call supply, right? So you want to give them a response of neutrality. So ignoring isn't neutral. Eye rolling isn't neutral. Arguing isn't neutral. You want to go in with neutral responses, pre-planned neutral responses, almost like mantras, right? So something like, I'm not going to discuss that right now. Neutral. You're not going to yell. You're not going to, you know, say it in an annoying way. Just neutral. Or if they say, you know, I, you know, I, I haven't heard from you and it's been months. You're right. You haven't. What can they say to that? right? You want to, I always use a rock wall as an example. You don't want to give them anything 
to be able to put their hand on, put their foot on, put their pinky nail on. You want to give them a blank wall that they just slide right down. So anything <laughs> you give them, they're going to try to, 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 to use. But if you say, well, yeah, yeah, you haven't. Or if they say something like, I don't know, you, you, you look like you put on some weight. Yeah, I have. You know, or you look really tired. Is your marriage okay? I'm exhausted. That's it. Everything fact-based, no emotion, no emotional words, no opinions, nothing. So if they, you know, something like um, they'll try to bait you, they'll try to push your buttons, be very mindful. You had said this before about your nervous system. Be very mindful of how your body physically feels in those situations. Notice your breathing. Notice your heart rate because that's your body trying to protect you that you're in danger. Your brain doesn't know the difference that it's your mother versus a lion chasing you down the street trying to kill you. It just starts prepping you for battle, right? It preps you. to You're either going to fight back, you're going to freeze, whatever your response is going to be, or you're going to cater to them. Be very mindful of your physical self and try to separate it from the situation and understand that that's your body doing what it's always done to keep you safe. It's not, it's nothing scary. Um, but yeah, I think the expectations are the, are the biggest part. Go in knowing that this is going to happen. If it doesn't great, chances are it will. Holidays have always been really difficult for me. I mean, I'm single right now, but I've always been so scared of like when I meet that person, when I meet my person and I have to introduce this person to my mom and I have had to do that in the past. I'm a completely different person around my mom than what the world sees, what my friends see, what my potential partner sees. And it's almost like I have to prep to say, you might see a different side of me. I may not be as loving as as humorous, as responsive as I am in real life because I tend to shut down. And I feel like that's affected me in my romantic relationships. I would love to hear your take on what you've seen in terms of narcissistic parents who have abused their children in some form or way or another, whether through manipulation, mental, physical, emotional abuse, and now are trying to navigate relationships, how does that show up and how can that affect romantic relationships? Yeah, excellent question. I feel like we could talk about that one for days and days A whole and other days. episode. <laughs> um, right. I think the first thing is to acknowledge that it will affect your relationship. Not if it does or how it It will. Um, again, it's about being mindfully aware of how it does come into the relationship. So I think one of the things is children of narcissistic parents in romantic relationships and even friendships tend to look at situations as almost like guilty until proven otherwise, because they're very hyper vigilant, very hyper aware of like, excuse my language, but getting fucked over, getting hurt. So they tend to go into these relationships with magnifying glass and like, you know, searching, 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 searching. And sometimes that's necessary because sometimes we repeat unhealthy patterns, right? And we gravitate towards things that are familiar patterns in relationships that are familiar that aren't necessarily healthy. Um, So sometimes that's, that's, that's helpful to have that hypervigilance. And at the same time, sometimes it's detrimental because we're looking at things that aren't there and our perception of them is a little bit off. So we're a lot off. So this is why I recommend therapy because you can bring these situations up in therapy and kind of have this understanding of, okay, am I repeating old patterns? Am I using an old lens to look at a current situation? Um, The other thing is be very open with your partner. You know, say I'm perceiving the situation like this I don't know if it's because I'm looking at it how I used to or if it's different and talk to them about it, you know, and, and, and let them know because you, if you've been raised by a narcissist, you're so used to your perception of things, you know, being told your perception is wrong, being told you're crazy, being told you're overreacting. And so what children of narcissists often do is they'll keep that to themselves because why would they want why would they want to hear that again? And so oftentimes they may miss things in relationships because they're scared that they're overreacting. And maybe they are, but have that conversation. 
You know, the other thing too, is I tell people to look at the facts, look at the facts of the situation, even write them down. Look at the behaviors and the behaviors only. If I am videoing you and I can't see it on my phone, if I'm videoing you, it is not a behavior. And we get stuck on thinking that our thoughts and our feelings are behaviors. They're there. They're valid. They're real for you. But we want to focus on the behavior so we don't get wrapped up into our perceptions and our emotions and our you know, core beliefs about things. But look at the behaviors. Is it manipulative? Is it moving you towards what you value? Is it taking you further away from what you value? Is it making you feel unsafe? Look at the behaviors and use that as your guide. Otherwise, you can get lost in all this other stuff, which is important. But when it comes to relationships, you really want to focus on the behavioral part of it because that's kind of the, the that's going to give you more information than your than a possible perception of a situation. I think for me, when I look back at how my relationship with my mom affected me as an adult, and I'm in a lot better position I am now than I was a couple years ago, but it's a work in progress. But my perfectionism is my yes. trauma. And I've talked about this before, but it's for me, I've always had to do everything at the highest level. We were talking before the show and I told you I was in the Marine Corps. Like I went into the Marines specifically because I'm like, what's the hardest branch and what's the branch that hardly any women want to go into? That's the one that I want. What what do I, I want to do a bodybuilding competition. I want to win. I need to train as hard as I can do. I literally, when I do something, I put 150% into it and I get hyper-focused. And that's my, it's, it's helped yes. me survive. But because for me though, if I don't do everything completely independent from needing help from anyone else, I am afraid that I will have to depend on my mom who's not dependable. And even if she does something for me, it's transactional. If I do this for you, you're going to owe me this. I rang up a phone bill when I was 13. She still yes. says I owe her $500 from that. The $10 that I owe her from last year, she just requested a yeah. cash app or from me. Like it's, it's yeah. always transactional and I don't want to ever have to depend yeah. on that. So I've always done the best that I can do. And I've noticed now that it's kind of like trickled to my daughter and I've had to catch that and nip it because I don't want her to think like you have to be perfect at mm -hmm. everything. You don't have to be perfect with the way you look, the way you manage school, the way you manage friends. This is a me problem. Yeah. This is not a you problem. And I would also like love to ask you, I want my mom to have a relationship with my daughter. I, I don't want her to be isolated because although I know that she – my mom's like textbook narcissist and I realize that. She's personality disorder 100%. But I also know she's got major, major trauma and I don't want her to be alone because like the irony of it is that they deeply want connections but they just go about it in really manipulative ways. But – I don't want to isolate my mom from my daughter either, but my daughter's getting to that point where she's also at that age, 14, becoming very autonomous and now noticing those practices and those trends. And she's like, I don't want to hang out with her this weekend. So it's like, how do you navigate yeah, that? So that was my question to you. My question to you was, have you asked her? Yeah, I, I do. I do. So when my mom wants to hang out with her and I'll ask her, do you want to go? Um, sometimes it's a yes and sometimes it's a no. But when it's a yes, it's usually because she feels bad. It's yes. not because she really, really yeah. wants to go. It's because she feels bad yeah. that she doesn't want to hurt her feelings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's, 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 it's a really difficult situation. I mean, like when you said with the, for the perfectionism really quickly, I just want to say one of the reasons why a lot of children with narcissistic parents have this perfectionism quality, there's two reasons. One, because they're, the love from their parent was conditional, right? If you're not the best at something, if you don't do this, if you don't, then I'm not going to love you, right? Or I'm going to, even more so, withhold love from you. And so perfectionism is a form of control. It's something that, that we can control how good we mm. think we can control, how good we do something, how perfect we do something. So it gives the child a sense of control, false control, like a worry is a false, 
illusion of control. Perfectionism is the illusion of control. It's, it's why, you know, with eating disorders, for example, same thing, it's, it's this illusion of control. So when you're in an environment that is very much based on what's called inconsistent reinforcement or intermittent reinforcement, you never know what you're going to get. As a child, you have to come up with ways to feel like you can predict what's going to come next. And so perfectionism is a great way for a child to do that because they can, they, they, it's totally theirs. It's, they own it. The problem becomes, right, as, as you go into adulthood with perfectionism comes procrastination, <laughs> yep. comes fear of failure, right? Comes um, unrealistic, unrelenting expectations and standards. And then do you also put that on other people? And that's where it starts to trickle in. And so with perfectionism, um, you know, comes that, comes that failure aspect, which then sets you up for this vicious cycle. Um, I think with your, with your daughter, um, I think the biggest thing, you know, when you see the autonomy piece coming out is to remind her that that is a strength, that it is something that you want for her. And I think it's important in a language that a 14 year old will understand, explain to her why what she's feeling is valid in relation to her grandmother. I think it's important for her to know that you understand because you've dealt with it maybe in different ways, but that what she's feeling, again, isn't wrong. She's not crazy. She's not alone. And that she can speak to you about this thing because it's 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 going to be really difficult to, to navigate because she's going to be modeling that which she sees and you don't want her to feel that her autonomy is something to hide. Um, you know, but I, I think also part of it is the relationship that you want her to have with her grandmother. Are you looking at it as, I want my daughter to have a relationship with her grandmother versus the reality, which is how is my daughter going to have a relationship with her narcissistic grandmother? Again, it's kind of mourning the loss of the relationship that you hope your child has yes. with the grandparent. Yes. And that's where it's so hard for me because I I want them to have a relationship because I – and I know person. I'll never have it. I know my mom right. wants it now and I feel like this is her version of trying, but she's she's got no supply. Like you have to conform to my boundaries yeah. in order to get anything or have a relationship. Yes. So I, th- I feel like that's the only reason why I'm seeing some effort now. And I think that's also where you have to be careful with the triangulation. When the grandparent starts to call the grandchild and make plans directly through them without letting the other parent Oh my God, know, yes. Or give, <laughs> like, yeah, like, hello, right, right. I'm, call me. Yes. I'm the mom. She's a minor. Why yes. are you making plans? Correct. Oh my God. Like, so true. So yes. true. Yes, that's the stuff with the self, and they'll start texting them directly without going through you, or they'll start make plans. With it. And, and, you know, next thing you know, your mom's showing up at the house. Why well, have yes. plans with it? You know, it, it, <laughs> and then right. I'm like, well, what yeah. am I going to yeah. say? You know, like I'm not going to be like, oh, right, you can't go with Nana, well, you know? So, but, but, here's the thi- <laughs> but here's the thing you you can because she didn't go about it in the way that you told her she needed to go about it. So, yeah, you may look like the bad guy initially. But that's the whole point. The whole point is for you to look like the bad guy if you say no. Right. That's the triangulation. Ugh. And I think that it's sometimes you have to kind of, you have to kind of, and here's why. And it's the same with intimate relationships. If let's say a narcissist cheats on their partner and then they take them back and then the narcissist cheats again and they take them back and the narcissist is emotionally abusive and then they take them back and on and on and on. You can't fault them because you're stuck in this. You don't even realize you're in it. Um, the way the narcissist rationalizes that is, well, if they were unhappy, they would have left. Or I guess it could, the abuse couldn't have been that bad. I mean, they stayed, they came back. So it gives them this, this, this entitlement of, well, I'm going to keep doing it then. So if you don't set that boundary in this situation, right? Of, you know, if she just shows up and am I going to be the person to say no? Yes, actually, yes. Because it sets a boundary. It doesn't do that intermittent. Like sometimes you set the boundary, but sometimes you don't out of your own guilt. Well, they know that. They know that. And there's a reason why they went around you to your daughter. There's a reason why they show up. Because 
the when you say like, what am I supposed to do? Say no. Yeah, mm-hmm. yes, because I guarantee you, if you do, that won't happen mm-hmm. again. If you don't, it gives a narcissist that entitlement of, well, I mean, she didn't stop me, so mm-hmm. I'm just gonna do it. And as you know, with narcissistic relationships, the abuse gets worse and worse and worse and worse. It doesn't get better. And it doesn't stay the same. So true. And I think it's for those listening, I know there's some light bulbs going off because we always talk Mm -hmm. about the narcissist ex. Well, I'm co-parenting, but we Mm -hmm. never think of the mom, the grandparent and how that triangulation can happen. It's so true. So do they, I, you know, my question and what I would love to, you know, end with is, does the narcissist mom love, do they love their kids? Is their love there for them? Okay. I just got chills. I, I literally have chills, but I, I, this question gives me like such a, like, oh. okay. So here's what I say. A narcissistic picture. And I'm not talking about features. I'm not talking about difficult or toxic. I'm talking about true narcissistic personality disorder. Narcissists are not able to love and reciprocate love and unconditional love in the way that non-narcissists are, period. They love, and I'm doing quote, air quote, they love based on whether or not they can get their needs met in any given situation. So if you meet their needs, if you give them the supply that they need, They'll love you in whatever that looks like for them. If you're not willing to be the supply source for them, if you're setting boundaries because that love is conditional, well, then they're not going to love you. They're going to withhold their love and their attention, their affection. It's very, as you said, transactional. Um, It is very much based solely on which makes them the narcissist, what they can get in any given situation. Um, it is a very difficult pill to swallow. It is so lonely. That's got to be so it's lonely. Ext- they won't go there though. That's the whole point of the narcissist. Is they won't ever access that because the, that's too, it's too, um, that's too much of a wound. That's too deep of a wound. They won't go there. So they will put on this, this exterior, which is the personality disorder to make sure that that never happens. Mm-hmm. They will hurt you before you hurt them. They will cut you off before you can cut them off. They will be in charge of the dynamic of the relationship of what they choose to give you. Um, I think that they, you know, and this is why when in, in romantic relationships, when you hear that, you know, the narcissist, it, discarded you and they're done with you. And next thing you know, you hear two months later, they're engaged and living with the person. Like, well, did they ever love me? And they feel like, was any of that real? They're not capable of that unconditional love. It's not the same. It's based on supply. It's based on what they can get. It's based on what, how it's based on control. The more they can control you, the more they can control your emotions and the situation, you know, they get more supply from that. It is a hard pill to swallow. And I, and I like how you said a lot of people, it's, it is a grieving process and oh yeah, I appreciate yeah. you acknowledging that because it is a grieving process to know that I know I'll never have that relationship with my mom. Yes. And as yeah. sad as it is, I kind of have to accept it because she's never going to be able to give me the type of relationship that I'm able to give my daughter. But the blessing behind that is that luckily I took everything from what I went through with my mom and I know that that doesn't work. I know that it didn't work with me and thank God that I didn't end up in a worse situation in my life, which I easily could have. But I want my daughter to know that she's validated, that she matters, that her autonomy is a blessing, that she is her own vibrant person separate from me, even though there's so much of me in her. And Mm -hmm. the way that I parent, I'm thankful that I went through what I went through with my mom because it made me the mom that I am. And I know I'm a good mom. 
And yes. I can like proudly say that there's no, anybody who knows me and knows my daughter, they know yeah. that I'm a great mom. And, but I, I, I could say that because I genuinely care about what she feels about things and how she thinks about things. And I take her opinion into consideration. Because you have empathy. Oh yeah. My empathy is like right? times like 20. You have, <laughs> right. You have empathy. That's why. And, and, you know, and I also tell people exactly like you said, if one thing you learn from it is how you don't want to parent. You know, we always think we have to have perfect role models to learn how to parent. We don't, we actually can have horrible role models and learn from that what we don't want and how we don't want to parent and how we don't want to be in relationships. I think that's something that a lot of times we lose sight of is that, and I'm not trying to, you know, say like, oh, the bright side, there is no bright side to this. What I am saying is that you can take those experiences and use that as an anchor point that's all the way maybe on the left side and you go on the right side and then over time find somewhere in the middle. Right. Um, I think that's super important. And I, you know, I, I also... I think that when you are parenting, um, you and I tell this people when they're when they're having children or the children are young, you're going to have these moments where you're parenting, and it's going to hit you like a ton of bricks, memories that you had when you were that age or how you were parenting, and you're going to have these moments of like, holy shit, I never would do that to my child, yep. and you're going to get angry at your mom. Yep. It's happening now. My daughter, we were talking, we were talking yeah. behind the camera before the show started. And I was telling Dr. Z, my daughter's 14. And when I was 13, 14, I, that, those were my most traumatic years, 13, 14, yeah. 15, um, experimenting with drugs. I started having sex at the age of 12. I was it, taken advantage of by so many men, not boys, men, yeah. um, you know, just the, the lifestyle that I had is so different than my daughter's. And I noticed that it started bringing back a lot of memories that yeah. I put under the rug that I have not thought about. I don't, you know, like, I don't think about my assault. I don't, I don't even cry. I, I was even from when I, the time that I was assaulted and it was like, I had to go to like rape treatment center. Um, I had to get counseling. They did like, I remember like being at the police station and the police being like, she spells, open the door, like all of these like really traumatic memories. Right. And I never once cried and I'm starting to have these memories again. And I notice, and I'm like, man, I never processed those things. Never. My, my nervous system was it like, wasn't safe to process yeah, fight or flight. I'm like, yeah, I, I never had the support. And I look at my daughter and I'm like, part of me is like, God, I'm so thankful for her having like a normal, healthy childhood. But I mourn for the child that I was because I I missed out on so much of my life. So and yeah. I'm in my 30s now. And at least I have so much more life to live. But it makes me sad that I didn't have that support system. Yeah. But what can you do? Right. So now I'm thankful for people think, like I, you who are yeah, having no, these I think platforms. What you do yeah, I think what you do is you allow yourself to be sad about it and you allow yourself to be angry that you missed out on so much and you allow yourself to grieve. Do we wish it was different? Of course we do. And I don't think anybody's saying, you know, be thankful for what you had. I think that, you know, and what I tell people is you have every single right in the world to be angry, to be sad, to feel cheated. You go, I mean, you are entitled to it. And I think, you know, a lot of the times when we try to avoid it and think, well, it could have been worse or well, even when you say, you know, well, my mom, she, she has her own trauma. Fine. But so do you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you're actively choosing not to have that trauma play out in your parenting. Mm -hmm. It's the normalizing You're of the trauma that I was so used to. And I think people get yes. used to hearing that's normal, that generational trauma that's you're supposed to get hit or these things are supposed to happen. And it's like, no, no we're not normalizing no. trauma anymore. No, no, no. And, you know, and, and, and I think when people say, well, you know, I remember I had this one time and I was so, this is for a whole other conversation, but, you know, some, a lot of times people are torn with exactly like you said, when it's a parent, especially a mom, you know, she has her own trauma. I understand why she is the way she is. You know, it's kind of, she wants the connection, but she doesn't know how. I, I one time had somebody, you know, cause there's a lot of, you know, when I say, you know, when narcissists in therapy, they don't go to therapy and I'll change it, you know, and then I'll get attacked like, well, you're a psychologist and, and, you know, and you shouldn't say that about people and that's stigmatizing. 
for me to say that somebody is not capable of love in the way that we are, and for me to say that somebody is not going to change as a psychologist takes a lot mm-hmm. for me to say that. Mm-hmm. I don't, I don't take it lightly. And so when people will say things like, you know, well, somebody said to me, well, narcissists are wounded humans and they should be treated as such. I mean, here's the thing with that. You, the trauma that you went through because your mom was wounded, does that then justify what you went through? I don't think it does. You know, I, I, my patients who are sexually abused by their narcissistic husbands every single night, do I tell them, well, they're a wounded human? No. So that's, I like to separate the trauma from the active choice that somebody makes, right? Like your mom had trauma. She, it, not her fault. Not her fault. That part is not her fault. The active choices she makes as a result of that, those are hers. Just like for you, your trauma you went through was not your fault. And you make an active choice to break a cycle. Mm-hmm. So using somebody's trauma as a reason why they do what they do, I don't know. Yeah, I agree. You know, I don't know. I think it's a very fine, tricky line. I think how you handle it, though, is so unbelievably healthy. And the healthy way isn't the easy way. The healthy so way is true. the hard way. So it's, true. It's constantly being aware of your body, of your thoughts, of your behaviors, of the impact it's going to have on your daughter. Of the, it's never ending. It's a never ending process and it's exhausting. And it you is. do a phenomenal job. You know, you really, you do. I mean, you, you know, you, you do. And yeah. I think that the voice that you have and the platform that you have, and I think you convey that to all your listeners. I do. Thank you. Well, likewise, yeah. I, I, I'm so grateful for just finding your platform, connecting with you. And, you know, if you guys haven't listened to the first episode, make sure you check it out. I'll actually link it in the show notes if you guys want to check out part one. As always, Dr. Z, you are amazing. I'm going to link everything for everyone to find you. You guys, she's got two amazing journals out. She's doing big things with her podcast and her platform. Like it's free. Go listen. It's literally you're getting free therapy, free advice. And if you've ever dealt with a narcissist, she is the person that you want to find follow. So Dr. Z, thank you once again for for coming on the show. It was a pleasure. Thanks.